You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for February 16th, 2024. This week, I'm going to lead with an important update on a mistake I made in trial interpretation from last week. It's on conference intervals and p-values. I'll talk about percutaneous tricuspid valve interventions and news on HDL and humility in medicine. First, an update on last week. I want to update my discussion on the Arcadia trial. Recall that Arcadia tested apixaban versus aspirin in post-stroke patients who had evidence of atrial cardiopathy. Atrial cardiopathy could have been diagnosed by an abnormal ECG, a BNP, or left atrial size on echo. My discussion centered on the fact that the hazard ratio was 1.00, and there were equal number of primary outcome events, stroke, in the two groups. But this past week, I was educated by groups of trial experts and statistics professors that I had made a classic error. So I lead the podcast today with my mistake because it is such a core teaching point for interpreting medical evidence. My error, experts emphasize, was that I had equated the absence of evidence with evidence of absence. Let's translate that. Arcadia had the same number of stroke events in both the apixaban and aspirin groups. The hazard ratio was 1.00. The p-value was 0.99. Indeed, there was no signal of any difference. But the clue that I should have had right away was that the 95% conference intervals surrounding that hazard ratio of 1.00 went from 064 to 1.55. Roughly, this means that a pixaban relative to aspirin could have reduced stroke by up to 36% or increased stroke by 55%. And, and both of those would have been clinically important effects. So the expert's point, therefore, is that Arcadia was underpowered to tell us that there was evidence of absence of effect of a pixaban versus aspirin. But there are even more teaching points. You might wonder why the trial was underpowered. How did this happen? Well, trials have to make estimates before a trial as to how many patients to enroll. And the main variables that go into this estimate are the expected event rates in the respective arms of the study, as well as the minimally clinically important difference you would like to detect. They call it MCID. The authors of Arcadia estimated a 7% annual stroke rate in patients with atrial cardiopathy who had just had a stroke. Now, to determine a minimally clinically important difference, they used a previous trial of apixaban versus aspirin called Averos, and Averos found a 55% reduction in stroke with apixaban. And so they declared that a 40% reduction was their minimally clinically important difference. Now, more translation here. So they, quote, powered Arcadia to find a very large effect size. Now, you can go online, and I'll, I'll link to a rough sample size calculator to estimate how many patients this would require. And so when they put that in, they get about 1,100 patients. But, but, there is another factor in these calculations that, that, that does not appear in any calculator. And that factor is pragmatism. And before I started reviewing trials, I did not know how pragmatism figured in the design of trials. Now, what I mean is that trials cost money and effort. So if you try to detect small differences in the two groups, you're going to need many more patients. And so precision, like money, does not grow on trees. Dr. Sanjay Call, uh, who's a trial expert, calls this sample size samba. It's like a dance or tension 
between getting enough patients enrolled to detect differences, but doing so within the pragmatic budget constraints of the trial. Of course, many cardiology trials are funded by industry, and industry has plenty of money. So these tend to be mega trials that can detect small differences between groups. An example would be the Fourier trial of Evolacumab versus placebo. That had 27,000 patients. So I went online and I played around with these online sample size calculators, and I entered a 25% reduction in stroke with the Pixaban in Arcadia. And this would have re- required triple the number of patients. Well, that would have required more funding, and Arcadia was not funded primarily by industry. So you can see how Arcadia got to those wide conference intervals. They declared as their minimally clinically important difference a 40% reduction. And the problem with that, of course, is that we would all agree that a 35, 38, 39% reduction in stroke would be quite important to know. So because of these revelations, I would amend my take of Arcadia as saying we simply do not know whether or not apixaban is better than aspirin in the cohort of atrial cardiopathy patients as defined in this study. Further, we have also not settled the issue of whether or not markers of atrial disease or cardiopathy is an important predictor of success with oral anticoagulant therapy. And the final point, however, affects my views of RCTs in general. While I still believe RCTs are the way forward in knowing what to do in medicine, we have to be very careful, super careful, and how we interpret the uncertainties in trial results. All right, next topic is going to be the tricuspid valve, two topics within a topic. And structural interventions for tricuspid regurg, TR, had two big weeks at FDA. And so we're going to talk about valve replacement and valve repair percutaneously. Now, before I tell you about the developments, let's set out some quick background on tricuspid regurg. TR is super common. Most is secondary TR, which means the valve leaks because of pressure or volume overload. TR is easily seen on an echo. In other words, secondary TR means that it almost always occurs because of something else like mitral regurg or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. TR almost always gets better when you treat the underlying cause. The patient who has TR as a primary source of their problem is uncommon. So a nice trial that I'll link to from the uh, CTSN uh, investigators published in New England in 2022 tested concomitant tricuspid repair at the time of surgery for mitral regurg. The trialists reported that concomitant repair of the tricuspid valve reduced the degree of TR, it had no effect on mortality, and it increased the rate of pacing by 6x. So clearly this was not strong evidence for adding tricuspid repair to surgical mitral repair. And this trial illustrates my point wherein TR commonly accompanies other pathology. This background is important and I think largely ignored by FDA because when these interventions are approved, I think there will be a tremendous incentive for doctors to overuse them. So let's first talk about percutaneous tricuspid valve replacement. The first tricuspid valve replacement called the EVOC valve was cleared for use without an advisory committee meeting recently. The valve replacement was studied in a trial called TRISEND-2 that, as far as I know, is not published. It was presented at the TCT meeting in October of 2023. Edwards Life Sciences makes the valve. The approval process began with FDA declaring the valve as a breakthrough therapy. This is important because part of that designation is that FDA may accept greater uncertainty if probable benefits outweigh harms. Now, I try to keep cynicism at bay, but getting this designation really sounds somewhat dodgy to me. Trisen had a two-part design. The first 150 patients were like a safety feasibility group. The total cohort would be 400 patients. The report below is just the first 150 patients. Here, we get only safety and really soft endpoints. The total cohort study will add clinical outcomes like death, tricuspid valve surgery, or heart failure hospitalizations. But again, the report that we get, this first part of TRISEN2, does not include any clinical endpoints. So enrolled patients had to have signs and symptoms of TR, and a local heart team determined the patient is appropriate for tricuspid valve interventions replacement. 
Exclusion criteria included anatomy that would not work, low life expectancy, EF less than 25%, bad RV function, and pacing leads. But, but, not all pacing leads. Jailing a pacing lead with the valve was allowed if the patient was not pacer dependent or had a primary prevention ICD. The primary endpoints of this trial are really problematic. There was a safety endpoint, which is a composite of major adverse events, safety events at 30 days, and the primary efficacy endpoint at six months was a composite of TR reduction, that's an echo parameter, and then a combination hierarchical endpoint of KCCQ, quality of life questionnaire, New York Heart Association, a functional class, and a six-minute walk distance. The safety endpoint was derived from real-world data from tricuspid valve surgery, surgery, and it was set as a benchmark of 44%. I kid you not. If they had a less than 40% major adverse event complication rate at 30 days, the new valve could be declared safe. So the first efficacy endpoint, TR grade reduction, or the proportion of patients with TR less than moderate, And the second efficacy endpoint was KCCQ improvement greater than 10 points or New York Heart Association improvement by one class or six-minute walk distance by greater than 30 meters. The trial procedures were valve group versus uh, optimal medical therapy, which is primarily oral uh, diuretic tablets. It took about two hours to place the valve. Hospital stay for these patients was about four days. And the results. I know you will be shocked. I know. The valve group met its primary safety endpoint. But get this. Of the 96 patients randomized to the valve group, 26 had safety events. The 27% incidence of safety events easily passed the bar of safety. Now, these were safety events uh, like uh, three deaths, 10 severe bleeds, two device complications, and 14 new pacemakers. But keep in mind that pacing with a tricuspid valve replacement is not going to be a small thing, right? Because you cannot put a pacing lead through a tricuspid valve replacement. At least you shouldn't. So to pace patients who have a tricuspid valve replacement, you actually have to go into the coronary sinus and pace out into the coronary sinus, which is doable but not super easy. So the efficacy endpoint showed a marked reduction in TR, and of course, the hierarchical endpoint, which was qualitative and subjective, was also positive. Because when you compare subjective endpoints like KCCQ and New York Heart Association functional class in patients who had a procedure versus those who did not have a procedure, there's going to be a massive placebo effect. And it's the same for six-minute walk distance. Patients with surgery are going to be motivated to go that extra 30 meters. The author's final slides declare the benefits of the new new valve. They write, treatment of severe TR with the EVOC system resulted in meaningful improvements in functional status and symptoms at six months. And then they wrote this, quote, the unique trial design of Trisend 2 based on FDA breakthrough designation status provides an early look at the safety and effectiveness of the EVOC system in the first 150 patients. Important clinical and echo endpoints, including mortality and heart failure hospitalizations from the full cohort of 400 patients, will be presented in the future. But I would add that in the future, this thing's already going to have a lot of uh, tailwinds and excitement and therapeutic. It'll become a therapeutic fashion. And uh, if this data isn't positive, I don't know that it'll matter that much. So my comments on this, I hope they do finish the study and tell us about hard clinical endpoints like death rates and tricuspid valve surgery and heart failure hospitalization, but it could be well into the future, and like I said, it might not matter. I find it shocking that FDA would approve this valve without even an advisory committee meeting based on this data. I mean, think about it. A 27% rate of major adverse events, that's nearly one in three patients who had a bad outcome. And one of the efficacy endpoints is an echo parameter, TR. And of course, it's not blinded. The other two efficacy endpoints are subjective. There's no placebo arm. Now, online, a few doctors called me out for dissing the subjective endpoints. They were like, come on, John, it's important to make patients feel better. And my response to that is, of course, it's important. But to know whether a tricuspid valve intervention actually does that, you need a proper sham or placebo control. You can't do a procedure in one group and give the other group simple tablets 
and make conclusions about quality of life. The fact that colleagues of mine, those with MDs after their name, are that easily bamboozled shocks me. Sanjay Call had a nice comparison on Twitter. He compared the approval of this new valve with the rejection of a new drug called patisserin for ATTR cardiomyopathy. Now, patisserin was studied in the Apollo B trial, which had 359 patients, almost three times the amount of patients that uh, the tricuspid valve uh, study had. And participant had a win ratio versus placebo of 1.27, so positive. But the conference intervals of that went from 0.99 to 1.61. The advisory committee meeting voted 9 to 3 in favor, but FDA rejected patisserin. Call noted that Trisen had fewer patients, shorter follow-up, and all components of the efficacy endpoints were susceptible to placebo effect. And patisserin had a proper placebo. It was a good contrast between standards for drugs and devices, and I'll link to his uh, tweet on that. Now let me move to tricuspid valve transcatheter edge-to-edge repair, or the triclip, percutaneous clipping of the tricuspid valve for TR. This week, the FDA convened an advisory committee meeting to evaluate the application for the Abbott triclip transcatheter edge-to-edge repair system for patients with severe TR, now, I've served on an ADCOM uh, meeting before for the drug vernicalant, and what happens is that FDA presents data, the sponsor presents data, even the committee hears from the public, and then they vote on questions. So the big three for the triclip were A, was the device safe, B, was it effective, and C, were benefits greater than risks. Now, ADCOM committee relied mostly on one trial, the Triluminate trial, which I've covered here multiple times, and I'll keep it brief. But before I tell you the results of the vote, and before I recap Triluminate, I want to set aside that there may be a niche for patients with severe TR for this percutaneous approach, because A, these patients can be quite symptomatic with edema, right heart failure, and and B, surgical tricuspid valve approaches are quite risky and have high morbidity. The problem, of course, is as I stated earlier, most of TR is due to other issues in the heart. Now, Triluminate may have been the most disappointing trial I have covered in my critical appraisal career. It's disappointing mostly in its design. As you recall, Triluminate tested triclip versus medical therapy in patients with symptomatic TR. The trial delivered a positive results for the triclip, but the authors chose a three-component hierarchical primary endpoint of all-cause death or tricuspid surgery, hospitalization for heart failure, or an improvement in quality of life as measured by the KCCQ questionnaire. Note that the first two endpoints are objective and the third one is subjective. The results favored the triclip with a win ratio of 1.48 and the conference intervals were 1.06 to 2.13 and the p-value was 0.02, so it was statistically significant. But, but... The positive results occurred solely due to the KCCQ aspect of the endpoint. The heart endpoints, like death and heart failure hospitalizations, did not differ. And another curious finding in Triluminate was, if the device worked so well to improve quality of life, the six-minute walk distance did not improve. There were no significant differences in that endpoint, and I find that interesting. And of course, the core problem with Triluminate is that it did not have a placebo procedure. It's highly likely, therefore, that a placebo effect drove the positive results. And the thing of it is, is, and this is the disappointing thing, is that everyone involved with this design knows this. This week, the primary investigator of Orbital 1 and 2, which tested severe coronary lesions with a placebo procedure, that is, they randomized people with proximal LEDs or proximal rights to a sham or placebo PCI, Dr. Rasha Alami tweeted the following statement. She said, or she wrote, Of course, a placebo-controlled trial of TriClip is possible. It is time for these trials to become entry standard for interventional procedures aimed at improving subjective endpoints. We should not accept substandard evidence of efficacy for procedures with both risk and cost. Well, the advisory committee voted positive on all three questions, and it seems likely that FDA will also grant approval to the TriClip for tricuspid valve regurgitation. Now, my summary comments, I'm not against helping patients with TR, but this is a mess. 
there are proper ways to study devices. You need hard endpoints. You need proper controls. Doing a proper placebo or sham control for a transcatheter edge-to-edge repair for a tricuspid valve is, would be simple. It's not hard, but it was not done, even though the scientists charged with studying this device knew it was necessary. And the FDA was the last line of defense. I have no idea how regulatory guidance could be this weak. FDA could have demanded proper studies. Now, in a perfect world, where doctors were wise adjudicators of evidence, these devices would be used sparingly in very select patients. But in a profit and productivity-driven system, I doubt this will happen. I'm sad for our profession because proper studies were not done. I'm sad about the FDA. I do hold out some hope that my colleagues will not uh, fall gullible to marketing pressure. But again, it's a small hope. My final topic today is on HDL, cholesterol efflux after MI, and humility. This is a story about how good stories often don't pan out. HDL is known as the good cholesterol because it takes cholesterol from the periphery back to the liver for excretion. HDL levels, therefore, inversely relate to cardiovascular outcomes. High HDL levels, to a point, associates with less cardiovascular disease, yet, yet, Despite a massive effort by lots of people and companies, modification of HDL levels have not proven successful in reducing cardiovascular outcomes. It's, of course, different than LDL, right? So lowering LDL has been shown to reduce cardiovascular outcomes. But the first step in the cholesterol clearing process is called cholesterol efflux. And for this, you need a big protein called apolipoprotein AI, which is the chief protein of HDL. This clearing process may be especially important in the days after an ACS or MI. But in the days after MI, it seems cholesterol efflux is diminished, which is obviously bad and may contribute to recurrent events early. Enter center stage, a novel, infusible, human, plasma-derived APO-AI that robustly elevates cholesterol efflux with relatively modest increases in APO-A. This compound may be less susceptible to such acute phase modification and might retain functionality during this time period. So, the story goes that this agent can elevate cholesterol efflux capacity and it may be beneficial among post-AMI patients. But this week, we learned that the Aegis II trial, which was a placebo-controlled RCT that randomized more than 18,000 patients after an ACS, did not meet its primary efficacy endpoint of major adverse cardiac events reduction at 90 days. As a result, the company has no plans for a near-term regulatory filing. There were no major safety or tolerability concerns with this experimental agent. The results are going to be presented at the upcoming ACC. You can keep this story very short, but once again, the message is humility. Humility because stories that make sense, raising HDL or increasing cholesterol efflux after MI, usually don't pan out. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened and thank you. And remember, friends, if you like this podcast, please give us a rating, write us a brief review. If you disagree with something, write a comment on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology website. Until next week. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the Heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.